All right, so uh, welcome to uh, advanced programming course. I will be your um, lecturer for the semester. We will have a teaching assistant, but I haven't organized um, I haven't organized the person yet, so I will introduce the person next time on uh, on Monday. Um, and from the organizational things, we will not really use Blackboard. We will use um, we will use this, uh, Discord and GitLab. So those of you who have already got membership into the uh, GitLab, um, all of you here, don't need to do anything. And then I will click through in a short break uh, the remaining people. Uh, and we will kind of heavily use this. I, I am changing a little bit the format of the course compared to the last years. Uh, and we will also use um, labs. So there is another section in the in the GitLab, which is called Proc 206 2023 Labs. And that's a group. I, I kind of made a mistake because I organized the lecture um, lecture project as a project, then you cannot have kind of a sub projects under the projects in GitLab. Um, so we will have labs and then each lab will have its own um, section. And then we will use pull requests and um, we will kind of use Git for managing the labs. So I would like you to also request access to this one, to the Proc 206 2023 labs. Uh, and then once you are given access right to that level, then everything else will kind of follow. So have you used GitLab before? I think you did uh, for the other courses. So that should not be a problem. If you have any questions, of course, kind of ask me. So please request access to this one. And those of you who have not requested access to the course, please request access to the course. Um, we could do just with one, but I sort of laid it out wrongly, so we have to do two. Um, with Discord, uh, I got one student uh, saying that um, he, he didn't have the Discord uh, link. Let me quickly check if the link from last year still works. So no, 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 not here. So I have a kind of a long readme file, which explains the, the rules of the course. And there is a link there and maybe it still works. Yeah, it seems to work. So you can use that link. So there is a, a invite link inside the rules. Uh, the rules is kind of a just a list of things that um, we agreed on. And it's kind of just to set expectations. OK, so the expectations are that you don't need to show up for lectures and you don't need to show up for labs. Uh, you can leave when you need to leave and you can come late. That's OK. You don't need to apologize or anything. I have to show up here, <laughs> so the uh, the rules are kind of asymmetric because I would like also to have ability to show up anytime I want and leave at any time. Um, we will have some obligatory tasks, and then the obligatory tasks will not really have a deadline. But obviously, if you wait until the very end of the semester and then everybody wants to have the obliques kind of uh, ticked off, some of you will not have it ticked off because I will run out of time. To get your obliques ticked off, you have to meet me or the teaching assistant and show the oblique. OK, uh, so we will kind of do it by kind of a show and tell. And that allows us to give you feedback and allows us to discuss it. OK, uh, in the previous years, we were doing it that you were submitting it. We were grading it and then we were giving feedback kind of in general. But I think having sort of a, a short catch up is, is better. And people in Olesund and in Trondheim are doing that. And it seems to work very well. It doesn't scale. So if we had a class of 600 students, we would not be able to do that. But with a class of around you know, 40 students, we can do that. And I think it's better. So we will basically meet for a short session. And you will just kind of a show and tell about the obliques. Um, depending how we will be doing the course, we usually have like three obliques and then two assignments. Uh, so probably it will be like that. I will have a talk with Christopher um, and then we will kind of try to align it such that you have a kind of a consistent workload such that you are not uh, overloaded. Um, how many of you are taking cloud course? Oh, so maybe who is not taking a cloud course? And why are you not taking cloud course? Uh, I have already. 
Yeah, perfect. So the, the thing is we will use the cloud course as a kind of a jumping board into Golang because cloud course is kind of depending on Go and we usually spend the first two weeks or three weeks introducing Golang in the cloud course and then um, we will use this course to kind of do more advanced things. Uh, so the basic fundamentals about Golang will be there. So I will meet you again tomorrow, uh, with exception of one student who already had it and he is probably already all right with Golang. Um, so then the rest of you will meet me tomorrow uh, for the cloud and then we will kind of continue with, um, with Golang there. Right, so what else is important in the rules? Well, it, one important rule that uh, kind of allows um, applies to you is that we kind of expect you to work at home um, and yeah obviously all courses expect you to work at home but the difference with this course is that this course is kind of fourth semester course and it's kind of beyond the half of your degree so what happens now is you're kind of transitioning from being a more passive students who are being taught certain things certain fundamentals to more kind of active students who are just teaching yourself what you need to know and what interests you, right? You will have more projects work, you will have more individual kind of input into your courses and you will be kind of becoming sort of uh, your own teacher in a sense. So my role here is not really to teach you a lot of things, but to create an environment where you can teach yourself. And then for the things that are hard, me and the teaching assistant will be helping you. But we kind of rely on you doing more heavy lifting okay uh, so the so that you kind of learn how to do that right we don't know what programming languages you will be using in 10 years and most likely you will have to teach them yourself right and you need to acquire some skills to be able to do that quickly right so we like myself in this course and some other courses will kind of are transitioning to relying on you doing a little bit of heavy lifting right so in the in the first three semesters if you just follow the lectures and did the assignments, you will be okay. From now on, it's kind of borderline. It's kind of not okay. You need to read a little bit yourself and you need to do a little bit of your own work. And for that, we are using two books. It's the Rust book and the Haskell book. We are expecting you to read them. Um, you know, reading books for programming, how fun is that? Not so much fun, <laughs> but it will help you. And actually reading some books about programming will help you long term. Um, yeah, we will come back to that later. All right, so what else is important here? Uh, there are lectures, there are practical sessions, deadlines. Yeah, so about the deadlines. Uh, as I said, Oblix will kind of not have deadlines, but I will set some soft deadlines and then we will see how many people are kind of ticking off the obligatory um, uh, tasks um, in time and how many are postponing. The assignments will have deadlines because for assignments we will use a system relying on peer review. So you will review each other's work and for that we have to have kind of a synchronicity. So we have to have a deadline when all the submissions are finished and then we'll have some period for the reviewing, for the peer review. Uh, so we will have some hard deadlines for the assignments. I, I said we are probably going to have only two assignments. Um, so it shouldn't be a big deal and then the hard deadlines you have to meet them if you don't meet them then you fail the assignment um the assignments kind of form a portfolio um yeah so that's also a little bit tricky so we have this um legal situation in ntnu or in norway in general that for everything that requires a letter grade we have to use an external reviewer and i cannot give you that letter grade myself i have to ask somebody else to check right so imagine that we have five or six assignments they are kind of a project base and somebody else has to go through them for uh, marking the, the assignments that's a lot of work and nobody wants to do that like i don't want to do that for somebody else's courses right um, so we have to kind of uh, do a little bit differently. So from the other hand, if we only have exam and you are not get, getting a grade for all the work that you're doing through the semester, that's a little bit unfair. So we kind of need to balance it off. So the, the thing how it works is you have to do the obliques, but technically the obliques are not part of the portfolio grade because they are not assessed for the, for the grade. But then I have to give something to the external reviewer to give you a grade for what you've done. So then you will write a short report, right? 
which you will talk about the obliques and all the work that you've done. But technically the work itself is not being graded with a letter grade, but it is kind of is because you can point out to what you did and you kind of has, oh yeah, this is my Git repository and blah, blah, blah. So this report goes to the reviewer and then based on the report, you will get a letter grade for the portfolio. And that is 60%, right? So 60% of the grade actually comes from the work you're doing through the semester and then 40% is the final exam. Obviously the exam um, cannot be as you know, uh, engaging and as uh, long lasting as the semester worth of work. So that's why 60% comes from the internal uh, work that you do. Uh, so even though technically the obliques are not letter graded, kind of pay attention to what you're doing and then use some notes and then you will use them in the report at the end of the semester and then it will go to the for the grade, right? Um, so it's a little bit of a work around. So instead of giving the, uh, the external all the submissions and everything for, for the um, reviewer to check it, the reviewer checks the report and references to the code and then on that basis gives you the, the final letter grade. Um, yeah, so I, I'm recording the session. So some of the talking and kind of uh, theory parts will be recorded and I will put them on YouTube so you can watch them afterwards or those people who don't attend the session can watch them afterwards. The practical sessions and the question and answers and so on will not be recorded. So you need to show up if you want to participate. Uh, because we are recording it, uh, there is this issue of anonymity. So if you don't want to be in the video, don't show up here. <laughs> Uh, and then if um, you have, like, let's say something happened during the class and then you have an objection of that lecture to be posted on YouTube, then you can tell me and I will not post it, okay? So it's sort of, um, I think it's mutually beneficial if the content is available online, but also I, I have to respect and everybody has to respect your privacy. So if you don't want something to be online, it will not be, right? That's why the labs are defin by definition not online because we kind of chatting and discussing things and it's kind of more personal. But lectures, it's only usually me showing up and talking, so that, that's usually okay. But in case there is a situation, just let me know. Okay, and then course feedback. So because it is, as I said, I'm, I'm trying to kind of create an environment for you. And sometimes it works for some people and sometimes it doesn't work for some people. So it's kind of a co-creation, uh, co right? I need your input to what to change and what works and what doesn't, okay? And that input you can give me just talking to me uh, or we will have a wiki page where you can uh, you can do that. And also we have this official NTNU process where you have a class representative and so on and so forth. We have some meetings, but that process is kind of slow. And that process is mostly for changing the course for next iteration, right? Because the reference group prepares a report and then based on the report, the lecturers adjust the course for the next iteration of the course. But that doesn't affect you and it's too slow, right? So if we need to change something in the course, just make an issue in the issue tracker or talk to me saying, well, you know, this doesn't work or this needs to be changed and then we'll change it this semester, right? Um, so that's kind of a faster iteration. All right, so did I forget about anything here? I don't think so. Um, so, Discord, GitLab, um, Git, uh, Blackboard only for some unusual announcements. I'm using it mostly like a mailing list. Um, okay, so if any questions about that? No questions. So the most important thing, I, I think 8.15 is kind of early to show up here, okay? So I have a proposal that we start at 8.30 and we will run without a break. So instead of having 8.15 and a break, we will have 8.15 and no break. Who is against that? <laughs> Nobody is against that? Okay, so next time we meet at 8.30. It's an extra 15 minutes, but in that time of day, <laughs> those extra 15 minutes is kind of uh, worth more than later in the day, okay? So that's fine. Um, so let's do this. Let's do a short... Um, yeah, it's not short. Usually I'm chatting away and it takes some time. So if you join the uh, Mentimeter, I will ask you so some questions and then we'll run through some, some of the initial theory of, of the course.
So while you're doing it, I will tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally Polish. Um, I studied in the UK for my master's degree. After then, I went to uh, New Zealand where I worked as a research assistant. I was always interested in AI and kind of uh, artificial life. And they had a position about um, doing some, helping some researcher code some uh, multi-agent systems. So I worked there for, well, I went there for one year. Uh, but I loved it so much that uh, it ended up being 16 years. So I lived 16 years in New Zealand and I finished my PhD there and worked in, uh, in a lab which was doing some um, artificial life and multi-agent systems. Uh, while I was there, I also got involved in startups. So I was part of a startup which was doing kind of a networking stack on a multi-core CPUs from Sun Microsystems. And at the time when we were working with them, it, Sun Microsystems got acquired by which company? Oracle. <laughs> so Oracle bought Sun Microsystems. Um, that was a kind of a big deal because Oracle was always kind of a business facing, you know, men in suit kind of type of enterprise. And Sun Microsystems was always kind of a dream workplace for geeks, kind of uh, guys with dogs going to, to work and um, you know, all the engineering kind of a high, um, high rank engineers. If you think of, of a kind of a typical one, most of them work in Sun actually. So Sun at the time had uh, multi-core processors, which were 256 CPUs on a chip. And it was so powerful that they wanted to kick out Cisco out of the market by producing kind of a blades, which were based on the general, general purpose CPU, which were able to do like a network filtering and routing um, directly on a, on a uh, platform which is used for general purpose computing. So you can partition it, you can virtualize it, and you can have some networking kind of uh, subsystems already running on the blades in the data center that you have, so you don't need to buy extra equipment from Cisco. And the goal was to have, to be able to do on the standard hardware, 10 gigabit per second processing, um, which was only restricted to some high-end Intel and uh, Cisco equipment. And, and we could do that, actually. We could do that with uh, graphical C uh, GPUs, and with the uh, 256 um, CPU uh, machine by pipelining it. So you, you did, um, you have kind of a long pipeline and par each part of the pipeline is done by one CPU. And you have to kind of count it in such a way that you don't get like a, a data cache misses. So it, it kind of work, works smoothly through the whole pipeline without ever hitting a cache miss such that it never needs to go to RAM. Um, and that process took like six months and we had to do manually kind of uh, uh, manage our code. Like you introduce one extra variable in your function. You say int a extra variable and that exceeds the, the space which you have on the uh, um, cache and the, the whole program goes like 100 times slower, right? Um, so then after that, I was missing my parents and missing life in Europe. So I talked with a friend who was working here and he wanted to go back to New Zealand. So we kind of swapped. So I came here, I liked it. And, and he said, okay, so you stay, I go back. <laughs> so uh, that's what, how it happened. All right, so let's, um, let's continue with this. So which programming languages do you know? Yeah, by the way, I know you survived graphics programming, uh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we know it, it's a kind of a, a challenge to do graphics on the third semester. It actually was kind of an intentional um, bug, let's say, in the design of the degree. Um, and it was really hard to fix it. We historically had graphics programming in the fourth semester, and that was much better. And I still think it's much better. Um, but because of some dependencies with the data engineer degree and so on, we kind of need to leave a space. And also NTNU forced us to do uh, from 10 points to seven and a half. Um, so it ended up in the third semester and that is causing a lot of problems. So what will happen, You unfortunately you are the last year who has that system. Uh, from next year onwards, 
uh, we will instead of graphics in the third semester we will have a um, security course which is much much easier uh, and then we'll have graphics in the fifth semester and by the fifth semester you will be kind of much better equipped to do some fun things with a graphics course so that that is the change which we kind of uh, implementing from next year which does not affect you unfortunately uh, but I think it will make the degree better uh, all right so it's mostly um, C++, let's say, Python. Um, it's kind of an interesting mixture of programming and scripting languages, <laughs> which we'll come back to in a, in a moment. All right, so then the next question is uh, print hello world. Which language is that? It used to be Python. <laughs> now you have to have brackets in, in Python in your functions. Um, it could be anything, could be bash, right? Um, many programming languages have this kind of construct of doing output and then strings are enclosed in double quotes. Um, so in what languages can you write hello world? So even if you think I don't know the language, but can you write hello world in that language? Yeah. You can only pick one. Oh, crap. <laughs> All right, apologies then. Forget about it, because most of you will pick C++. <laughs> uh, all right, that's the bug. bug. OK, so um, where are my dining philosophers? So dining philosophers is a much more involved um, uh, problem. So you know the, the problem? Yeah. It's kind of a problem accessing resources, and you have to use some sort of a synchronization paradigm you have to synchronize some constructs semaphores or something and then you you're doing access so in what languages uh, you can do that do you only need to pick one in this one crap <laughs> all right my mistake um, so apologies for that so how many of you can do it in three languages two only one <laughs> okay so we're going to change that in this course. Um, what language do you think is the best language to do dining philosophers in? Obviously, that question is kind of subjective. But there are some general properties of a programming languages which make that language more suitable for addressing that problem. Exactly. So some of you think that, you know, C or C++ is all you need. You can do everything in those languages, right? That's a mistake. Uh, it's like saying I have a hammer. I can fix everything in, the, in your car. I have a hammer, right? <laughs> and a duct tape. <laughs> what? That doesn't work like that. Um, all right. So there are some ideas. Um, maybe Haskell, uh, maybe Go. So what would make a language better suited to do dining philosophers than C++? What would, what would you expect the language properties to be such that it is more suitable? Some ideas? So maybe one idea is that it allows you to express concurrency kind of easily, right? Uh, in C++, you have to define a thread, and you have to sort of manage the, the thread memory and, and so on. Uh, and then it's a little bit bulky to kind of do that. So one idea is that it's easy to express kind of a concurrent processes, right? Um, the second idea is that maybe it's uh, easy to synchronize. Um, again, in C++, you need to use atomics or semaphores or something, and you kind of manually have to manage that. So you have a language which manages that for you and allows you to kind of uh, have concurrency and synchronization done easy, then it would, would help. The third property maybe is that it prevents you to do synchronization bugs, that if you have race conditions or if you have some problems, the language helps you to prevent that or to detect it and manage that, right? Does C++ help you with that? Not really. You will struggle, right? That's why 
uh, Mozilla came up with Rust to because you know Mozilla wrote a Firefox and majority of bugs in Firefox were related to the synchronization and to multi-threading because a web browser has to be extremely concurrent because you have a lot of things to be done at the same time. So the code is very heavily multi-threaded and they had like 90% of bugs which were preventing them to do um, improvements and, and so on. So they kind of invented, invested in Rust to prevent those type of bugs. So C++ doesn't help with that at all whereas Rust kind of helps you, right? So Rust is already better than C++ because it has kind of a more uh, help with this kind of a final point, right? But actually um, one of the inspiration for Rust is another language um, which is called Erlang. And Erlang is a language from our friends from Sweden uh, it has been designed for the telephony networks, for the switches to be programmed for the telephony operators. It's an old language and it has exactly the same requirements. It's like extremely concurrent. You have a lot of calls coming in and a lot of people put their phones back and so on. And you, it has to deal with concurrency natively. So they have a lot of very interesting constructs of fallback and when things go wrong. Well, like when things um, uh, don't play out the way you predicted them to, to to work. So Erlang is probably one of the best programming languages which inspired other languages to deal with concurrency. It has an actor model, you can initiate new processes, you can kind of uh, control the other processes, um, you have kind of a fallback controller which if some processes die, the co con control manager kind of knows, oh yeah, something kind of, uh, somebody pulled the plug, I need to do something. Um, you don't have any of that in C++. You would have to code everything manually, right? Um, so of course you can do everything in C++, but it is harder and it is more buggy and kind of requires more, um, more time and resources. All right, so um, that's kind of a more philosophical question. Um, what programmers use in a day work the most? What do you think? Of course, we use it a lot, but I kind of like the uh, the brain showing up. Um, so, yeah, motivation, planning, algorithms, the brains. Um, so yes, we use internet, of course, because we don't need to remember everything in our heads, we can kind of use internet for a lot of things. But um, the primary uh, objective of programming is thinking. So that you cannot outsource to the internet. The, the thinking you have to do in your own head. Um, so um, I would like you to kind of try to be self-reliant as much as possible and try to use internet only for the syntax and only for kind of a details of what you want to achieve, not for how to achieve it. I want you to kind of try to think what you want to achieve in your head first and then only search for things that allow you to achieve that, right? So for example, if you say, I want to uh, do a loop in Haskell and I don't know how to do loop, uh, that's a bad example because um, let, let's say you want to do a loop in Rust and you don't know how to do loops in Rust, then you just Google loop Rust and then you see the syntax, how the loops look in Rust, right? But the fact that you want a loop for the solution came from your head. It didn't came from the internet, right? Because if you look for the solution on the internet, maybe you will find one with loop, maybe you will find one with recursion, maybe you will find one with false or something like that. And then how do you choose, right? You have to think what you want first and then you search for the for the solution right so let's try try that like i cannot force you to do this and of course uh you will be tempted to be kind of a googling how to do something and then you will get the solution instead of the kind of trying to find the solution in your head um we will come back to that in a moment as well um so yes we do have some questions which are graded oh not graded like uh 
you get kind of a leaderboard type of situation here. All right. Is this everyone in? I think it's not. I don't think time matters that much if you're fast. All right, so the first one is easy. Is programming and coding synonymous? Nice, it is false. Um, so, okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. So some people use the, the terms interchangeably and some of you thought they are synonymous. They, they are not synonymous. So if they are not synonymous, if they are, cannot be used interchangeably, so what, what is this differentiating programming from coding? All right, so the next question is, uh, say what programming is. So software development is kind of a very broad process. It involves many things, including programming. Um, <laughs> Pro gaming, no. So some some good answers. Um, the two predominant ones is finding solutions and making instructions. So finding solutions is kind of accurate. Um, programming is about finding a solution to something or planning how to solve something. Um, so if you mean making instructions in kind of a pseudocode, then programming is that. Uh, if you need to write like a pseudocode for somebody to code it, that is programming. In the past, that often was the case. Um, in the past, you know, uh, programmers were writing kind of a pseudocode or kind of instructions to a coder, and the coder was actually coding the, the solution in a particular language, right? So imagine that you're working in a company, and the company needs some sort of a piece of software in a language for embedded systems, and you don't know that language, right? It's like they are programming some sort of a software for um, designing uh, chips. Um, like, uh, you know, CPU uh, chips. And you don't know that language, but you can still write programs by kind of instructing in a pseudocode what needs to be done and how it needs to be organized, and then somebody will kind of code it for you, right? So you don't need to create files, you don't need to write text, although if you, by writing text you mean this kind of a solution of finding kind of uh, instructions. Uh, planning is good. Uh, logic is good, uh, developing solutions, planning solutions. Coding is not part of programming. Um, okay, so then what coding is? What are the kind of a primary tasks for a coder? If the programmer is trying to find a solution, what is the code coder doing? Yeah, obviously, right? Um, so you need to know syntax. You need to know the constructs of the language. Um, you need to be able to express what needs to be expressed in that particular code. So um, imagine that uh, you need to multiply two numbers really fast in an assembly for a particular architecture, for ARM architecture, and you don't know that assembly, right? So you tell a, a coder, like, please write me a routine which multiplies two hex numbers really fast. Um, on that architecture, and then the coder will do that. So is coding kind of a brainless? It's coding doesn't require kind of a creativity and, and, and uh, thinking? Well, coding requires a lot of creativity and thinking as well, uh, especially in languages like JavaScript. <laughs> uh, knowing JavaScript itself is like, whoa, you know? <laughs> um, so coding is kind of a, requires, but, Coding and programming requires two different sets of skills, 
right? Um, they work interchangeably. Sometimes we try to find solutions by coding, right? We often do that. We often do a little bit of coding and then it doesn't really work. So we do a, again a little bit of coding and then so on. And we're trying to find a solution. So we're doing the programming tasks by coding. Um, that's okay. Uh, but those are kind of a two distinct phases of, um, of the software lifecycle. Writing code, writing solutions. Yes, that's exactly the point. Um, okay, so um, there is uh, a general question of how well you know uh, C11. So it's kind of a self-reflection. What do you think uh, you know uh, C11? Um, there is a difference between um, knowing about something and knowing something. It's, it's kind of a nuanced, nuanced thing, but it has been kind of introduced by a famous physician, Feynman. Uh, he wrote about it, like I don't remember, in the 60s or something like that. Um, and the, the idea is that we know about a lot of things, right? We know about Charles or whatever, some actor or somebody, right? We know about all those things, but we re don't really know those people and we don't really know something, right? So for example, you all know about for loops, right? Uh, you've even used for loops in your programming, but do you really, really know for loops? Do you know how to unroll a for loop in an assembly language? What the compiler is doing with your for loops? Um, some of you do, and then you can say, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a spectrum, right? So if you have, I don't, I cannot write here, but I will wave my hand. So if you have kind of like a, 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 a spectrum and on one side, you kind of know about something, but you don't really know it. And on the other side, you, you really truly know something. Then it, it, it's kind of like a continuum, right? So somewhere along that line, you become an expert. You kind of know what you don't know, and, and then you kind of don't really have a high opinion about yourself, but you know shit more than those people who think they know, but they don't know nothing, right? Uh, so you have kind of like a, a chasm. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying kind of to push ourselves towards this kind of end of knowing something really deeply and not really uh, superficially thinking that we know something. So. The, the, the knowledge of C++, yeah, that, that is kind of a chasm. It's really hard to know C++, right? I, I think Strosup knows C++ really well, and then nobody else in the world is, is probably as good. Um, so let's test. Um, so you know some things, and some things uh, you don't know. So, so what's C++? C11 introduced. I guess it's a little bit of guessing. You probably are not kind of familiar with the history so well about C++ and you don't know exactly what it introduced. But uh, those of you who said atomics and multithreading are partially correct, they introduced both. Um, so C++, C++ 11 had kind of a new constructs, which were both for atomics and multithreading. Um, collections, they were already in the language before. Uh, garbage collector, that's probably never going to happen for C++, let's hope. <laughs> and generics, um, a complicated answer. Um, some type of generic programming existed from the beginning. Some is kind of being shaped as the language kind of uh, progresses and there is more work about traits and how to do this kind of a meta programming in the language. Uh, but, you know, mo most objectively speaking, that is the kind of a correct answer. Okay, so how are we doing? Some people are doing very well. Some people are doing a little bit less well, but not bad. Looks good. So apparently that the speed was counted. Okay, so um, what programming paradigms do you know? Can you answer this one? Yeah.
object oriented functional what was before object oriented Ob object oriented created a little bit of a revolution procedural good so you all kind of know that one too what is c doing what's c what what what's c uh, language what paradigm is c language suited for procedural could say that is c object oriented not really but can you do kind of an object oriented programming with c can you have uh, structs and then associated methods with those structs could you implement like vtables the c++ vtables in c yeah, you could <laughs> it would be kind of a lot of work and it would be a little bit painful to use but you could you could use uh, object-oriented paradigm with C, even though C is not suited for that paradigm. Uh, would, would you use uh, C for functional programming? Can you pass functions? Can you have a function which takes another function? Yeah, you can. So you have some support for functional programming. Again, it will be painful and limited, like you don't have laziness in C. Um, so some languages are kind of suited for some paradigms, but not that that good. But you can kind of do everything in C, right? Uh, same as you can do everything in C++. So mostly object-oriented. Um, structural programming uh, was the one which was before uh, we came up with um, object orientation. So terminology is important. And being able to discuss and kind of uh, talk about different aspects of programming and programming paradigms is kind of important. So the one which we started was kind of a scripting versus programming. W what do you think is the difference? What is the difference between scripting and what is different when you do programming? Is th th those terms are synonymous? Who thinks those terms are synonymous? I, I don't think they are synonymous, personal opinion. I think scripting is when you're doing something smaller, when a single person does something to make the computer do something. Um, and it's usually kind of a small, uh, usually single file, uh, usually for achieving something relatively small. You can talk to libraries and you can do a lot of powerful things, but the, the kind of the script itself is considered kind of, uh, you know, small. And programming, programming usually involves a team. Usually you do it with multiple people. Usually it requires maintenance, larger things, uh, more complex things. Can you do kind of a complex thing in a scripting language? Of course you can. People write, you know, uh, IDEs in JavaScript. It's possible, right? But it's the same, like, can you do shopping with your bicycle? Of course you can do shopping with your bicycle, right? But if you have to do shopping for other people eight hours a day, you know, as a career, and some of the shopping involves building materials, then bicycle might not be the best tool for the job, right? Uh, so it's the same with scripting and programming languages. People say, oh, of course, everything you can program in Python, everything, right? Um, nah, not really. Same as you can say, yeah, you can do everything with a bicycle. Why would you ever need a car? Uh, but if you're a driver and if, you, if your job is to, to, to carry things around for people, then a car is a better proposition than a bicycle. So it's the same there. But if you just want to go um, to play soccer with your friends, once in a while and you know it's just two blocks away why would you use a car you should use a bicycle or you should even walk right so it's the same here um, there are languages which were originally designed to be scripting languages and they kind of grew in complexity and support and so on and they became kind of de facto programming languages but they are not the the they genetics is scripting right um, 
and don't don't get me wrong it's it's kind of partially personal opinion but partially coming from experience i love javascript i turn into javascript and typescript like full on when a v8 engine for a node js came about because it is so easy to prototype kind of things and so easy to deliver software that is very appealing so for prototyping and building prototypes it's great but then you try to maintain it you try to keep it running for two years and you're gonna kill yourself okay uh the dependency hell the moving target hell the the you know some of the your dependencies will change version they will change the semantics of the method without telling you that this method has the same name takes the same parameters but it does completely different thing and your prog program will will break uh, and you will spend months trying to find what the hell went wrong like where is the bug um, so sure you can do that but i don't advise it right i i kind of think scripting langu languages have a place and they are very useful and they are very powerful and they are very good for certain things but when we're talking about programming developing complex software systems maintaining them for years changing them uh, then you kind of need to pick a programming language so i will hope you will kind of know the difference by the end of the course um, so we have statically typed versus dynamically typed again uh, statically typed languages tend to be um, more secure in a sense of telling you that things are gonna break uh, dynamically typed are much better for prototyping and for building kind of a simpler things uh, so a lot of scripting languages are dynamically typed a lot of programming languages are statically typed um, you can have languages with and without type inference um, you can have declarative and imperative languages um, you probably don't know any declarative language if your kind of knowledge comes mostly from C++ and C domain uh, so we, we will kind of learn a little bit what those what those are uh, you can have languages which are compiled which are interpreted or which are bytecode compiled right uh, these days almost all languages including all scripting languages moved into bytecode and just in time compilation and unless they cannot right so, some still struggle with that but most do so most of them will have intermediate representation which is in a form of bytecode and that bytecode is just in time compiled when you're executing the code so the first time you're running a function in a scripting language it's usually slower uh, you pay certain penalty for that but then once you run it once you actually have a machine code and the machine code will work uh, almost as fast as the uh, compiled languages most programming languages are compiled by nature like they they don't go through this kind of intermediate step right so you could say so what is java or c sharp right they do have this kind of intermediate step of a uh, bytecode representation and they require this kind of a virtual machine which does this just in time compilation to native code so are they kind of a uh, programming languages more or more kind of a scripting languages but um the technology for example for java and c sharp is so good and you also have a head of time compilation that you almost have no performance penalty comparing java to c plus plus for example in fact the modern c plus plus usually pans out slower than than the equivalent code in in, in java um so yeah it, your mileage may vary but it's, it's kind of interesting to kind of know some some of the details there as well um how how rich is the standard library so some languages like uh, rust for example went with, into a philosophy where standard library is very small so they provide a language with a standard library which is very minimal and then the rest of the functionality for example for networking or encryption or whatever is provided by additional packages which are maintained by the community so all this functionality comes from the community support right golang on the other hand so so mozilla kind of choose that philosophy they say we want a very small very agile language uh, and then what you use it for depends on your use case and then you will use different libraries for for doing the implementations golang on the other hand decided that say 
maintaining dependencies on your networking stack on the community is risky. Like the community may not maintain something or something may have bugs and something may not be as e um, uh, efficiently implemented as we can implement it in the core language because we can do some cheats. Like because we know what we depend on and how it works, so we can kind of cheat a little bit to make it even faster than if you do it as a library, right? Um, so Java, for example, cheats like that. There is a, a system call for uh, copying a memory, right? And it's directly implemented in assembly to make it as possible as uh, um, as fast as possible on the bytecode level, such that if you try to copy memory yourself by you know, by all the language constructs, you will always be slower than the one method which is in, built in into the language itself, right? So Golang did that. So Golang has a very rich library. And when you're doing most of your networking programming and encryption and things like that, you almost don't need any dependencies at all. Everything is in the language. So what does it do? Well, once you build a system, then there is no dependencies. So that means there is nothing to update when the dependencies change. If you do that in Rust and the dependencies changed, and then they say, oh, there was a kind of a, uh, we, we upgraded to the new version or whatever, then you kind of need to follow up because the moment you want a new feature or something, you have to be up to date. With Golang, you're kind of up to date by just compiling it with the new uh, version of the language, right? So there are kind of pros and cons. Um, they say uh, that having this kind of a rich ecosystem provides innovation and provides more um, robust uh, answer to the user needs. Maybe, um, I don't know. I, I don't think there is kind of a definite answer which model is better. There are lazy languages. You don't know any um, example of a lazy language, so you will have one after this course. Um, Languages with and without memory safety. Languages like C or C++ don't have any uh, constructs to prevent yourself shooting yourself into a foot with memory. You probably noticed that. Uh, most of your bug fixing was probably about memory management being done wrong. Um, so C didn't change so much. Uh, C++ is moving more and more towards uh, tooling support and support uh, in the language which kind of help you with the memory safety. Um, and then a big one, which is, do you want the language with or without garbage collector? Uh, it becomes often a religious kind of a desire to have something implemented without a garbage collector, which is kind of counterproductive. Um, because to be honest, all your software will run on a multi-core CPUs, on the multi-core platforms, unless it doesn't. Uh, if it doesn't, then this argument fails. But if it does, then the garbage collector almost never actually represents any performance penalty to your code. Uh, unless you're writing a game and you need to know exactly what happens when, in which case the garbage collector can kind of uh, drop some frames or can introduce some uh, time, time dependencies. But in most use cases, in most of your programming life use cases, you probably will have no benefit of not having a garbage collected language. Uh, you will actually benefit from having a garbage collected language. Um, so again, we will kind of explore it later. Uh, some terms which you already should know well, uh, encapsulation, you know it from object oriented programming, right? What if you were to explain to a 10 years old what encapsulation is, would you be able to do that? Okay, so if you can use it, if you can create classes and use encapsulation that you're on a kind of I know about level, if you can explain it to a 10 years old, you're on a kind of the I know it <laughs> level, right? What types are? I was grading uh, an exam for a new university recently and uh, the first semester, no, that, that's actually, yes, first semester students, uh, first introduction programming course, um, they had to write some functions and uh, they have to explain, let's say they had to do some reading of the code and they had to explain it. So they, for example, in C sharp, they had like a, a variable declared saying string, string name, right? And they write, oh, there is a string declared called name. No, it's not a string, it's a variable of type string, right? <laughs> 
you know the difference between those two um, utterances? I hope you do, right? So we are kind of more precise. We know a variable is a variable, right? It contains a string and it's of a type string, but in itself is not, name is not a string, right? Object versus instance, yeah. <laughs> Classes, pointers and references. You probably kind of are fine with all those terms. Variables, constants, mutable, immutable variables, um, literals. You know what literal is? Some languages have a very rich uh, literal uh, support. So I can express um, a lot of kind of a constructs in the language by just writing a literal. So literal is a, a instantiation of some constructs from the language directly by typing a text. So the, the simplest literal is a string, right? You enclose something in quotes and that becomes kind of a string. Uh, in some languages you can even say, I have this string, I can do dot and call methods on it because it is kind of an instance of an object already, right? Um, so another literal is a, you know, 10, like number, right? It becomes kind of a number in the language, decimal number. Some languages, most languages have support for hexadecimal and binary literals. So I can express um, hex or uh, binary uh, literal for the, um, for the language. Um, some can, you can create your own. So you can create, for example, currency, and then you have a literal for that currency, and then you can say, you know, uh, 10 euro, and that becomes an instance of the currency object, and it represents 10 euro, right? And it is kind of an easy literal. Um, C++ has a little bit of that, but not as powerful as some other languages. Uh, what is the difference between function and a method? Um, what are pure functions? And what are side effects? Um, you probably know all of those. Um, if you are kind of on a more of an ah, I've heard about site, you will kind of be moving a little bit more towards knowing things. Um, concurrency versus parallelism also is uh, a, a big one. So what's the difference between something being concurrent and something being parallel? Hopefully you had it in graphics, but if not, what, what's the difference? So if I have two, two functions, I have a function A and function B, and I say they are executed concurrently. Or I have two functions and I say they are executed in parallel. What's the difference? Any ideas? Yeah. Have you seen the word concurrency used more in like databases, for example, where things might happen at the same time, but not necessarily, while parallelism is like a bit more on purpose? Mm -hmm. That that's that's good answer. So in concurrency things may or may not happen at the same time. When you have two things happening in parallel, it they will happen at the same time. By definition of what parallel means. So if I have a single CPU and it doesn't have any hardware multithreading, I have to simulate those two concurrent processes being executed kind of at the same time by doing the first one a little bit, stopping it, then doing this one a little bit, stopping it, doing this one a little bit, stopping it, and so on, right? So I can simulate concurrency on, on a single CPU system by doing kind of a context switching and um, kind of a concurrent execution. But if I have two CPUs and they two work independently and those two CPUs are kind of executing my two functions at the same time, then it's parallel. So um, GPUs allow kind of a power processing, some multi-core CPUs provide power processing and so on and so forth. When we don't know what the underlying platform is and we only need to know abstractly about two things being kind of executed at the same time, but may or may not be actually happening, then we talk about concurrency. So most often when we talk about software, we talk about concurrency because we don't know what those threads will be running on, right? So if you have 
a multi-threaded C++ program and you deploy it on a Amazon single CPU instance, all your code will be sequential. There is only one execution CPU, execution unit. So even though you have 10 threads, all of them will be running on a single CPU, so you'll be doing context switching. They will not be run in parallel. But if you have some um, um, multi-core machine or GPU, then you can actually have a true parallelism. Um, so we kind of don't usually talk about parallelism unless we go down to the kind of a hardware level and we know things will really be done at the same time. All right, so let's have a short break. Uh, okay. Are we back? So let's let's continue. So the terminology, um, some of it we will uh, cover in the course. Uh, some of it we will not cover in the course, and I expect you to kind of cover it at home and then ask questions. Okay. So I'm not gonna talk today about class traits and meta classes. We're gonna talk about them when we talk about them in Haskell. Um, so some of those terms will come, kind of, kind of come up in the washing uh, when we talk about um, various things. So pure functions, functions versus methods, side effects, uh, literals. We will not talk much about concurrency and parallelism, but we sort of talked about it already. Uh, the rest we will talk later. Uh, and the same comes from here. So classes versus traits versus meta classes. Uh, some of those topics will come up um, when we talk about Rust and when we talk about Haskell. Uh, inheritance, you already know. Uh, generics, you know some. Uh, Haskell has a very powerful type system for meta, um, for meta classes. So we will come back to that topic in, in the context of Haskell. Um, some basic fundamentals about how computers work. So arithmetic operations, give me some examples. Additions. Perfect. Good. Logic operations, give me some examples. Bigger Sorry? Bigger. Yeah, bigger or equal or equal. Yeah, equality check, uh, bigger than equal. What else comes under logic operations? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. XOR. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you know all the truth tables for all those? Like, uh, okay, good. Contra flow operations. Give me some examples. Four. Yeah, perfect. Very good. Uh, okay. Expression and statement. Give me an expression example in C. Oh boy, it doesn't matter. C++, whatever language. And then a statement example. And tell me what is the difference. Oh, that's kind of complicated, I can see. <laughs> So if, if, is if a statement in C, C++, or is it an expression? Why? <laughs> they say it's an if statement. Yeah, they say it's an if statement, right? Uh, so it has to be a statement. In Haskell, if is an expression. So the if statement is not a statement, it's an expression uh, in Haskell. Um, and C, C++, if is a uh, statement, indeed. What is the difference? Okay, so a rule of thumb, like an easy rule of thumb, okay? If I can say a variable x equals, and on my right-hand side I have something, that something is an expression. So if I could say variable x equals if blah, 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 then if is an expression. But if I cannot, then if is a statement. So, does that make sense? If you repeat it one more time, it'll make sense. 
All right, so if, if I have a variable x and I make x equal to something, I'm, I'm doing an assignment, and if I'm assigning x to something, if that something is there, that is an expression. But if I cannot put something as an expression over there, that makes it a statement. So in C, I cannot say, you know, a variable x equals if blah, 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 blah. I cannot do that, which means if is not an expression, if is a statement. So statements live in the line of code on their own, and they cannot be assigned to something else, right? So everything which, like for example, a for loop, for loop in C, in C++ is also a statement, it's not an expression. But 10 plus 20 is an expression, I can assign it to X, right? Funny thing is, some things which are statements in one programming language could be expressions in another. And then the general rule of thumb is that languages which have a very limited number of statements but a rich language of expressions are more, much more powerful, much more easy to use because you can embed expressions everywhere, right? If I say if something, that something is an expression. So all expressions can fit in there, right? Um, so in Haskell, because if in itself is an expression, I can put if kind of everywhere in my code and it will work. In C and C++, I can only put if as a statement, like as, as a kind of a top level thing in my line of code, and I cannot embed it anywhere else, right? The, the, the if statement in Haskell basically works like this. It has the true part and false part, and it always returns a value. That's why it's an expression. So I can say, uh, make x assigned to if something, something true, something false, and then it will always evaluate to either left or right hand side, and it, x can be assigned to this, right? Uh, in, um, in C and C++, if is kind of a control flow statement, right? It's not an expression. So I cannot assign it. It kind of is used to control the flow of the program instead, right? Um, so if true, execute this, if false, execute that, and then at the, the next line doesn't care what just has happened, right? Um, if, if, if statement is an expression, it evaluates to a value, right? So all expressions evaluate to a value which can be assigned to something. Statements don't evaluate to anything. Statement is just kind of a, a control flow which ends and it doesn't kind of result, like it doesn't have a value in it in, on, on its own, right? Okay, hopefully you, you understood it. Uh, polymorphism and polymorphic. Uh, that's kind of a, again, kind of a complicated thing. Like you know about it, you don't really know it yet. We will, we will go back. Okay, so very quickly about Golang. I will kind of go very quickly here because I will repeat it tomorrow. So it's a comp contemporary C. It's a kind of a better version of C with garbage collector. Very easy to learn by doing the tutorial, like the tutor thing, the go tour, you probably already know like 95% of the language. Um, very easy to use, but because it's so easy to use, sometimes for more complex things, it feels tedious. Like, why do I have to have those if statements for my errors everywhere, right? Uh, it feels kind of a, a little bit like, Jesus, you know, do this. If there is an error, handle it. Do this. If there is an error, handle it, right? Um, well. It's great for networking. Uh, it's also very good for concurrency. Um, it really plays well with the with Docker uh, because you can make a Go program to be executable, which is kind of in itself a kind of a Docker container, and then you can embed it all over the place. Uh, it's really fast to to do large builds. I don't know if you have an experience building things with C++ or with GoLang or with Rust. Uh, yeah, GoLang just you know. Uh, if you have, you know, a, a million lines uh, code base and you need to recompile it with Golang is like super fast. With the other two, like C++ is slow, but Rust is like terribly slow. Um, okay, Rust. Um, it's a good alternative to C++ uh, because it has been drawing some uh, uh, design principles. Like it is designed for real-time systems. It doesn't have a a manage, uh, memory management built in. You have to manage memory yourself, but the language helps you to not make 
and in memory mistakes. Um, and it is kind of designed for be kind of a C++ replacement. It's for systems which rely on uh, real-time processing and which uh, require, uh, require kind of a highest level of performance and cannot live with garbage collector. Um, it feels pretty modern because it has been drawing kind of uh, patterns from C++ you know, 17 and so on and drawing patterns from Haskell and from other kind of a modern language designs. Uh, it's excellent for embedded systems because it doesn't have a very big um, built-in system libraries. So the core of the language is very small. So you can use it for embedded systems because it doesn't have much. Um, you have to use what you need from external libraries. So for example, Golang from that um, perspective is not that suited because it has a very big and large runtime system, right? Because it has a lot of built-in um, functions. It's very expressive. It's much, much more expressive to what you already know, and that will be causing some problems. That's why learning Rust is kind of considered hard, uh, because it's a very expressive language, and it's drawing some of the patterns from Haskell. But the ultimate expressive language is Haskell. So once you've covered Haskell, then all the other languages will be like, OK, piece of cake. Um, you will probably use it for some mobile or cross-platform or embedded development. It's, it's not that kind of on the top of the list of, um, of deployments yet, but it's gaining popularity and it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, and it's usually used there. Um, so that's why we were talking about the, the hammer and the duct tape. Like if you only know one language, like people know Python, okay? And they can do anything with Python, that's fine. But they cannot really do everything in Python. Um, you have to use a kind of a tool for the job, right? So if you have a hammer and a duct tape and you say, I'm a car mechanic, you will say, no, you're not a car mechanic, right? You're a guy with a hammer and a duct tape, okay? You can fix certain things and you are useful for certain things, but you're not a car mechanic. So it's the same with programmers. If you, if you say, I'm a C++ programmer, uh, no, you're not a programmer. You are a C++ developer, uh, you know C++, but you cannot be used for a wide range of problems to solve. Um, so. Uh, you kind of need to be flexible. I know it's hard. Um, it's good to stay in your comfort zone. Like, you know C++, you feel comfortable with it, you're going to use it for everything, right? Um, but once you put a little bit of effort, once you learn another language and another one and another one, you become kind of familiar and then you your comfort zone kind of expands. And even if there is a project with a language you don't know, you will feel comfortable going there because, you know, what you can expect. You can expect all the constructs like for loops, faults, you know, um, uh, iterations, iterators, um, recursion. Th there will be nothing in the new language will, will really surprise you, right? Uh, and then your comfort zone will be fine. Um, so, so that's what you're doing. Like you have another three semesters, and that's what I want you to kind of explore. Kind of explore things that make you uncomfortable, because then your comfort zone will expand, and then you'll be much more kind of around kind of a programmer for various way, um, projects and various tasks. So that's Rust. How about Haskell? Well, Haskell is uh, much more focused on fundamentals of what and how you can solve problems. It has all possible constructs, which we know from different programming languages. It's sort of like a superset of what you can expect. There is nothing in any programming language which doesn't exist in Haskell, but there is a lot of things which, for example, don't exist in Python or don't exist in C++. Um, and you don't know about them because they don't exist there, right? Um, in Haskell, uh, like it's like a superset. Um, it's precursor of many programming languages. It's sort of like a grandfather of all programming languages because it's being used by academics to explore different things and then they become kind of a mainstream afterwards. Um, it will kind of challenge your way of thinking. If you haven't programmed in Haskell before, it will be for some of you somewhat challenging. And that is kind of interesting because there is a hypothesis for uh, people who had Haskell as a first programming language to not have that experience. Uh, so in inherently, Haskell is not challenging. It's only challenging if you already have kind of a pre-design ideas of what programming is and how programming is done, then it becomes challenging. If you kind of approach it with like an empty mind, so to say, using Eastern philosophy, 
it's not hard in itself. It, it's actually quite straightforward. So you have to sort of reset yourself a little bit. Um, like it doesn't have variables. It's like, whoa, how can you program without variables? Like what the hell? Doesn't have for loops. Whoa, like that's come on, right? Uh, but no, you, you can do pretty fine without variables and without for loops, right? Like, all right. So it will make you a better programmer even if you don't use it. Uh, but I'm sure you will have fun using it. Um, I do. Um, it's ultimately expressive. I don't know any other language which wo is so expressive and uh, also so suc succinct, like so easy to express complex things in a kind of a short form, which also makes it a problem, right? I have a very good friend who um, who is a very good programmer, and he said that this type of languages make him kind of a uh, crunch because it's too dense, like it's too many things happening in like four words and you have to spend time staring at it and thinking what is going on, right? That's too much. He prefers kind of a more structured programming where you have it unrolled, right? It's kind of a compacted. For some of you, this compactness will be good. It will be a source of joy, a source of joy. But for some of you, this kind of a more assembly like expressions are easier to follow, right? Um, I don't know. Um, I think with training, you will be kind of liking both. Um, and it's very good for very large and complex systems. So a lot of banking software, uh, because the system is um, allows kind of a formal verifications and validations, it's used there. So finance sector is using a lot of Haskell. So if your career get, gets you to banking or some kind of a finance systems, you may be using it uh, because it, it, it provides kind of a verifiable um, computations. It's functional, it's pure and lazy. We will learn more about it later. It has very concise notation, as I said. It is somewhat academic, so it's not as mainstream in like um, general purpose application development or web app development. But having said that, like um, Facebook is, for example, they rewritten the um, spam filters and they kind of are filters for posts uh, using Haskell um, uh, engine for two reasons. One reason was that it was faster than the C++. Why, why it was faster? Because it allowed them to parallelize the checks much more easily. It was really hard for them to predict what can be done in, in concurrently or in parallel uh, based on the flow of the system. And with Haskell, that is just for granted. Like Because the language is pure and lazy, you can parallelize or make things really parallel kind of in a lot of places. And the second thing was that they could validate the rules. Uh, like if you express things in C++, the programmer has to check that there are no bugs and it's kind of hard. But if you express something as mathematical equations and, and kind of a Haskell code, you can formally verify that it will have no other side effects and it will do what you say it will do, right? Um, so for those two reasons, they kind of using Haskell inside Facebook, for example. Um, it is difficult. Um, so some of you will click very f quickly and for some of you it will take some time. Uh, I I'm not a very smart person. It took me, I don't know, maybe three years to really click with um, some of the concepts. Um, so we will not kind of expect you to click in kind of a one semester with everything. You kind of get kind of a fundamentals, right? If you want to get deeper, expect kind of a long journey. Um, so you're not going to learn the language in a year. It's kind of a, a longer journey if you really want to learn it. Rust is similar. Rust draws a lot of uh, ideas from Haskell and it also is considered a difficult language. Um, but the, the good thing is after Haskell and Rust, all other languages will always be easier. It's, it's always kind of... Um, um, okay, so also to motivate you towards Haskell, um, the for a couple of years, um, the highest paying programming jobs in terms of which programming language uh, they use, what language do you think it is? It, it's not Haskell, but what, what language do you think? <laughs> What's the kind of a, if, if you want to pick a language which will give you the highest yield salary, what programming language is it? I will give you a hint. It's a programming language from Microsoft. Which one? Java. Java? 
No, Java is not from Microsoft. So Java is from uh, Sun Microsystems, which was acquired by Oracle. So what other languages you know from, micro, uh, from uh, Microsoft? C Sharp. C Sharp, you know, what else do you know? F Sharp, it's F Sharp. So uh, that's the highest paid programming language. Why? Because F Sharp is functional and it's difficult and it's hard and there are no many people who know it. That's why the salaries are high because the experts are a limited set, right? Programming jobs such as JavaScript or Python, there are like millions of programmers. So the salaries are kind of uh, driven down because there is a choice. For F sharp, it's kind of limited. Yeah? Yeah, they use it for fi financial uh, systems. So they have, so a lot of F sharp is written in combination with C sharp. So C sharp is used for all the back office and everything else. And then F sharp is used for some core business logic, which needs to be done in functional ways such it can be verified that it kind of doesn't have any side effects. Um, so financial markets, uh, stock exchanges, uh, some mission critical uh, systems in, in military, government, uh, this type of jobs, yeah. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let's quickly crack the rest of the things. So Haskell, Rust and Go, all interpreted, some interpreted, all compiled. All right, here is your answer. <laughs> All compiled languages, same thing as C++, same story. You write your source code, you compile it, you get the binary. Uh, no bytecode. All right, so... E start, stopped answering questions, come on. You can do it. All right, so next one. Okay, about the trio again. All languages are dynamic, some are dynamic, or all are strictly typed. <laughs> Come on, I gave you the hints at the beginning of the course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why some mistakes, right? So the next one. So all have type inference, none have type inference, some have type inference. All right, by, by now you, you should know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, three times and you didn't work out the pattern. So the pattern is we have three languages for the course, all are compiled all are strictly typed and all have type inference. Why? At 8.15 at the beginning of the lecture, I, I, I told you why. <laughs> no, it, it's a very simple answer. Okay, I tell you, because this is a programming course. <laughs> okay, it's a programming course, not a scripting course. All right, yeah, I know, I am a little bit opinionated. Okay, so I have my opinions. You may disagree with them, that's okay, okay? Uh, you should be critical. If I say some bullshit, you should call me out. You say, no, Mariusz, that's not true because blah, 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 right? So if you have an argument, I will listen and I will learn. 
Um, so don't take my opinions for granted. Don't uh, don't think I'm always telling you the truth, right? Um, I will probably be all, all right most of the time, but I, I can make mistakes and I can have my own personal opinions, which are a little bit biased. Um, so challenge me, kind of think for yourself. Don't don't believe me, everything I say. Um, okay, so coming back to C and C++ and kind of refreshing the terminology. Um, so what do you think about C and C++? Do they have type inference? So C doesn't really have a type inference. Like if you don't tell in the source code what type of something is, the system will not work out for you. It will be either compile error or the system will kind of assume uh, something that is like a um, opaque pointer or something. They, they will not work out what, what is there, right? Uh, so C doesn't have any form of type inference. You have to be very explicit for everything yourself. Uh, and then C++ does have it because you can say auto, right, in your source code. And then the compiler and the system will work out exactly what type something is. Uh, so you don't have to be precise everywhere. You can kind of uh, use some uh, mental shortcuts and then the system will work out what something is and everything is strictly typed. It doesn't mean that if you say auto that the thing doesn't have a type. It has a very well-defined type, but you just don't spell it out. It kind of is inferred from the right hand side or from somewhere else what it is, right? Uh, so C++ has a form of type type inference, uh, but C doesn't have it. All right, so good that we clarify that. Right. So we have kind of a reshuffling on the on the leaderboard. So coming back to the course, we focusing on individual work. Uh, so everything is individual. We will not have a group projects. Uh, this semester you'll have a lot of group projects with all the other courses. So this course is a bit of a relief. You don't have to work in a group. You're kind of on your own. Um, we try to balance a theory with practice. Uh, and the theory is important for us to talk and for you to talk, right? We need to kind of understand the terms and we need to understand what we're talking about, such as to, uh, you know, argue my case, right? So if I have a developers meeting and we are solving some problem and someone says, ah, oh, we should solve it by recursion. Uh, and somebody says, no, 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 a, a simple fault is enough. Do you understand what I just said? If you don't understand, then, you know, you kind of, in the wrong place, in the wrong meeting, right? You have to be able to kind of understand what is being discussed and what does it mean uh, and what implications does it have for the complexity of the solution and so on. So the theory is important, but theory doesn't exist without the practice, right? So if I watch kind of a people doing pull-ups and push-ups on YouTube uh, for 15 minutes every day, will I get fit? No. <laughs> I will probably know more about push-ups and pull-ups, what not to do and what to do, but it will not make me fit, right? So it's the same with programming. Like if you watch programming YouTube videos, it doesn't make you a better programmer. You kind of know more about programming, but you kind of still lack the skills. Like you need to type the stuff out. Um, so you need to kind of um, do Doing is kind of very important. Reading and watching is important. You learn about more, you learn kind of concepts and theory, but practice is important. All right, so here we have, um, yeah, so can you get fit from watching videos? You cannot. Um, can you have a meaningful conversation with your team? Yeah, hopefully yes. After this course, you will have more meaningful conversations with, with your team. Um, and then uh, one more question and then we have one more um, concept that I want you to to understand so function polymorphism that's also a scary topic it's also a complicated topic so you know C++ but you can't really discuss it that that well 
uh, indeed, uh, C++ has function polymorphism, and we will kind of talk a little bit about it uh, more. Um, so we have, again, a reshuffling on the... So Paul is the overall winner. Congratulations. All right, so you as a developer, you as a kind of a person in this industry, you will often be wearing different hats. Uh, so that's the final thing I want for today. What those are? So can you tell me now? Yeah? No, no, no. Yeah, that's just uh, like a, a metaphor of wearing a different hat. Yeah, so you will be wearing different hats. Uh, you will be filling in different roles. But what those roles will be? There are more, but they're kind of a four fundamental. OK, so let's do very quickly a, a thought experiment. It's, it's going to take us two minutes. Um, let's say um, a customer says, um, I think I have it here. Yeah, a customer says, uh, build a command line app which the customer enters two numbers and then the system returns a sum of those two numbers okay how hard is to do it super easy right we would say okay what would you do so how would you start Come on, it's gonna take longer than two minutes if you if you don't say. <laughs> so, how would you start? Do you know exactly what to do? Yeah, you create an addition function, which takes two arguments and returns the sum. What what are the arguments? What, what type will you use? Integers? Uh-huh. What if they uh, want the floating point? <laughs> well, I mean, we actually don't know, right? First thing is like, yeah, great, that looks simple, but uh, you know, what numbers they will be? Like, uh, do you want integers or floats? Okay. Uh, they will be like, um, if we, they want integers, Will they be possibly arbitrarily large integers or they will be limited? What, what's the highest integer they could enter? You know, what, what is the application? Is it arbitrary large integer? Then well, yeah, we have to use something else. If it's like up to, you know, 64 bits, we can maybe use long, right? We don't know that. Okay, so first thing, we need to actually answer some requirements, questions which are not here, uh, okay? Can they be negative numbers? Can, can it be zero? How to deal with edge cases? We don't know, OK? OK, second thing, yes, we have to decide how to do it. Templates, you said. Maybe. Maybe the, they say, no, we just want arbitrary large integers, right? You don't need templates. So then you just say, yeah, we just do input uh, validation that, that doesn't have any characters parse it into the integer, do the sum, print out the output, OK? Um, so then we, we did those two things. So we did one thing, and then we did the second thing. Then we have to code it, right? And then once we coded it, we, we give it to the customers. They try it and say, no, 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 I, I didn't want that, <laughs> right? So then there is a the fourth thing, right? So already here, we have four roles. Uh, we have the analyst. The analyst looks at the problem and this, this, you know, deciphers all the edge cases, all the requirements, all, all the specification, right? Uh, what the customer really wants. What is that we need to build, right? Um, the programmer thinks about the solution. Should we use templates? No, nah, arbitrary large integers, we can just use specific type. So there is a type for arbitrary large integers in most programming languages, we use that, right? Uh, Coder just codes the solution, implements it, right? And then the tester, the tester has to validate and verify it. So what's the difference between validation and verification? Remember that. So validation 
is when you check what you did with the customer. Is it what they wanted, right? So validation is you validate that the requirements and the, the uh, needs from the customer meet your specification, that that's reflected. Verification is that the program actually does what the specification says. If you enter two numbers and it comes out with the something that is different than the sum, then you broke verification. If you show the customer what you did and it adds two numbers, like as we discussed, and they say, no, 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 because the numbers in, are in binary, it's not decimal numbers, those are binary numbers the customer enters, then the validation failed, right? Because you expected they enter in decimal, right? So you have kind of fill, filling up those four roles. And we often do that interchangeably. And we often do that kind of subconsciously, right? All right, so I went a little bit over time. Apologies for that. So that is it for today. Uh, there is no homework. We meet tomorrow, and tomorrow there will be homework. <laughs> Thank you.